Hi and welcome back to PDA Dad UK. In this episode, myself and Adam Pearson from The Grumpy Gets got to speak to the amazing Kelly Waite. You may know Kelly from shows such as Obsessive Compulsive Cleaners and Country House Cleaners. She's an amazing advocate for OCD, for fibromyalgia, for mental health and for bullying and her anti-bullying stance. Fantastic interview, so please do join me. As I say, welcome back to PDA Dad UK. Before I go on, hit like, hit subscribe, ring the bell. You'll always know when new content's coming up, but you'll also be helping me hit that 10,000 subscriber mark. It'll be a huge deal for me, so please go ahead and do that. Thank you. As I say, myself and Adam Pearson from The Grumpy Gits, we got to sit down with Kelly Waite and talk about her life as a person who deals with OCD on a daily basis, with fibromyalgia, a bunch of other conditions that she has. She's autistic, she is phenomenal, and she's a massive advocate, and it was fascinating to sit down with her and hear her side of things. What really struck me was her stance on anti-bullying and the bullying that she's received for being open about her own conditions. So strap in, sit down, have a really good listen, and enjoy Kelly Waite. Kelly, how are you? Hi, yeah, I'm okay. How are you? Thanks. Oh, really well. You're brightening up the screen on what's generally four very ugly blokes. Well, three and Chris, who kind of passes, <laughs> just, and Adam, of course. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for asking me. Uh, no, you're more than welcome. Uh, if you guys don't know Kelly Wade, or if you sort of think, I know that face, but we're from, Kelly's a mainstay, especially on Channel 4. She's done things like uh, obsessive compulsive cleaners and or a bunch of spin-off shows to that, but much more than that, she's a massive advocate for the anti-bullying campaigns. And she's also uh, an actress, and she's made her own movie, which we'll talk about, well, short film, but which we'll talk about uh, in the uh, moments to come. So, yeah, Kelly, I mean, what are you doing at the moment? Is there anything that's press particularly uh, on the cards at the moment that you're doing? Well, actually, I'm doing a full-length documentary right now. I'm working on, on it as we speak. So it's just basically going to be a documentary, just documenting everything that I've been doing and mainly focusing on physical and mental illnesses as well. So it's going to be like like a, a diary form yeah. of a documentary, but then have other stuff in what I'm doing as well. Just tell us about that. I mean, you, 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 you're saying this, that this is a documentary made about you. You've got, I mean, you've got quite a list of things that you live with day to day that people probably realise just looking at you. Uh, what is it, you know, what are your diagnoses, if you like, or the things that you sort of deal with every day? Yeah, well, my diagnoses, uh, I've got Hashimoto's, which is a autoimmune illness. So basically, my immune system attacks my thyroid gland. So, I have that. Um, I have autoimmune thyroiditis, which is what, well, that's what it was called back in Australia. But I yeah. have that. Yeah, yeah, I, I actually... Exactly that. My immune system attack. If you, I've shown on previously. I used to be. I've lost twelve stones since I got diagnosed, and have been able to sort of deal with it. But I was when I met my wife. I was literally twice the man I am today. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, literally, um, like I've put weight on with mine. Like literally, I used to be like seven stone, and like now I'm nine and a half stone. So like I've put like, you know, quite a bit of weight on. But I've recently like just. 12 months ago, I had um, half my thyroid out. Like, I don't know if you can see, but I've got, like, a Oh, star. yes, 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 yes. Yeah, because um, I had, like, a nodule on half of my thyroid, which is common when you have Hashimoto's. But I kept going to get a biopsy, and, like, it was okay, and it was okay. Then it got to where it was intermediate, which is, like, you don't know whether it's cancer. They can't say for sure. So they would rather get it out than, like, wait but at the time, I didn't really want it out, you know, because I had stuff going yeah. on. I was like, oh, well, I'll just wait because if you don't know, it could be, you know, it could be Absolutely. either way. But then after a year, it got to the point where you couldn't wait no more because my, my cells had changed. So, like, they were, like, precancerous. So I had no other choice. I had to get it out, like, within two weeks. So I didn't want to, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh, you don't, do you? So, I you, you mean, you've had that... You've got the thyroid thing, which, I mean, I didn't know that actually on the research I did, that didn't come up anywhere. So that's kind of interesting to know. 
What what other sort of things are you you living with day to day? So I've also got OCD, like really bad OCD, and I have Asperger's, which is like um on the autistic spectrum. It is, in fact. I mean, what what I obviously, I mean, my wife, and my daughter, especially, they are both autistic. Yeah. And they don't even refer to Asperger's anymore in the sort of medical world because yeah. they've understood that by it, it lessens its severity in the sense of how it sounds. But actually living with it, it, it just because you appear to be functioning, especially for women, interestingly, doesn't yeah. mean there's not a lot going on under the surface. Uh -huh. What's that like for you day to day? Like, well, what you've just said about women as well, it's really hard to diagnose women because we do this thing called masking. So oh, yeah. uh, we're really good at masking. <laughs> I didn't get diagnosed till uh, a couple of years ago. So I was like, you know, good at masking. Because obviously a lot of people with people that have physical disabilities, you know, it's there to see. And I know there's like a lot of judgment, especially I've seen online a lot, you know, with blue badges and stuff where people are confronting people that aren't like in a wheelchair and stuff. Yep. That does go on a lot because people do view people from how what they see with physical stuff they can see it but with invisible stuff they can't so if they look at someone and they, they look okay then they just assume that there's nothing wrong with them so then straight away it's like you've got to like try and convince people that, that you, you're so right there's there's that element isn't there and i suppose i i masking's my big sort of push at the moment i i do a separate thing on pda dad uk which is all about helping people to understand autism and, and neurodivergence in general. But I got to speak at the TESN show a few weeks ago, and I actually spoke about masking because I want educational professionals to understand just how important this is because just because a kid seems to be functioning at school, they, they're bottling it all day and it's exploding at home. And it gets in the way of diagnosis massively. Yeah, I think a lot with women is they kind of be good at like um... – holding stuff in and like fitting into all the different surroundings but I think with boys they just show it how they are so it'll come out in behavioral stuff where girls they tend to like come out in other things it is like really hard because you know what it was actually it was um my best friend she actually she was the one who sent me some information on Asperger's because a relative of hers like her daughter they were in the middle of like looking into Asperger's for her. So she sent me loads of information asking if I'd look through with, with her and stuff. And when I was looking through, I was just seeing myself, basically. Because obviously, like, I never struggled at school or anything. I loved school and I was really good in, like, literally every subject. My whole life is, like, stuff like that haven't really bothered me. It was, like, more, like, personal stuff. Relationships especially, like, like I'm not even joking yet. Like, before I'm with my boyfriend now, because obviously I, I'm back with my childhood sweetheart. And he he was my first, like, my first love, my first everything. Like, I just loved him from the second that I saw him, basically, you know, when we were, like, 16. And he moved away and we lost contact. But what I did was in lockdown, right, when we had that first lockdown, because nobody really knew what was going on and it was all crazy. And I was like, I live on my own, so... I was like thinking, oh my God. And with me having OCD, I was literally on my own in the house for five months. I swear to God. So I, I was thinking, I didn't want anyone to come in that because I, I was, you know, so anxious about the whole situation. You know, and still to this day, when I get my groceries, I wipe everything with antibacterial wipes. I'm still doing that. It takes me like an hour to get all my food in and everything. <laughs> so when I was in lockdown, I thought, you know, no one knows what's going to happen, you know. This We could die tomorrow kind of situation. I was like, the only person I've ever loved is, you know, Alan. And I thought, you know, I'm going to message him. I just thought it's like, now or never. If he, if he doesn't reply, then, you know, we're in lockdown. And we just got back together after that. But I still wouldn't let him, like, come to mine until, like, we were out of the lockdown in the July. So we were talking for, like, five months and stuff. But um, he he was in a motorbike accident as well, so uh, like he's paralysed now, so he's in a wheelchair. Oh um, wow! Yeah, so I love him so much. Like literally, my love. Like all my friends will tell you, I've never, I never loved like anybody again after him. You know, like I was totally heartbroken for like years. Like seriously, 
got to the point where I just couldn't be bothered with relationships. You know, I had a couple of relationships and I, I was never interested in, like, I went, before I got back with him, I, I went 13 years and I never, I wasn't in a relationship, didn't do anything with a, with a guy, never went with them or anything. 13 years, I was, like, alone until, like, I contacted him in lockdown again and then we've been back together ever since. That's what I meant to be, isn't it? I love stories like yeah. that. So, Kelly, how how do you balance managing um, OCD, etc., and and your mental health with being um quote unquote famous and having a a public persona? Well, to be honest, it, I've used it as a platform to kind of like promote awareness for OCD. Like I did the shows basically to to promote awareness. For OCD, to be to be fair, though, <clears> when I when I did shows, I hadn't really gone public with my OCD, so there was like mm-hmm. even family members who didn't even know that I had OCD because I kind of like I hid it, and um I've had it all my life though, like as far back as what I can remember. I remember having it as a child, and so it was it's always been a part of me. But when I when I'm going through like severe anxiety and I get really anxious or panicky, my OCD gets like really, really bad. For me, it's the rituals that are so bad. So um, basically just just going to bed on a nice, you know, your nighttime routine. It can take me like an hour and a half to get into bed because of my routines. And if I don't do it right, I say something in my head that, I, you know, I... I shouldn't say I've got to go back and do the whole rituals again. And by the time I get back in bed, I need the toilet. So I've got to go back to the toilet and it starts all again. So, like, most of my nights are just, like, rituals. So I don't get a lot of sleep. And when I did the shows, you know, from locals, like, worldwide, I've had loads of amazing feedback from loads of people. It's been, on the whole, really, really, you know, good and like some people have supported me for years and they still support me all over social media and we have really good relationships and that. But locally, because I'm from a little village, like in County Durham, so you're talking like two and a half thousand people live here and basically everyone knows everyone. And I've had nothing but hate from local haters. I had so much bullying when I, when I first started on them shows. It was horrendous. Like, I had to get... It was that bad I had to get the police involved because they'd be coming to my house, hanging out outside my house, harassing me. We driving past in the street, shouting abuse at me, making fake Facebook accounts or messaging people, like, with my name, using, like, the, the fake account. It Holy was, crap. It was really, really bad. Like, even now, like, every time I'm in the paper or something, like, doing my charity work or like doing some TV show or something, the hate that I get from the local haters is, is you would not believe how bad it is. And some of these people are people who I was really good friends with as well at one time, who we've never had fallings out or anything. It's just, you know, when people drift apart and then all of a sudden be there on Facebook abusing me and stuff. And it, like, their friends and other friends, they'll, they'll all just join in. So it, it's like horrendous mm. nonstop with them. And they never give up because this has been going on since 2008. You know, when I was first in beauty pageants, constant, constant, constant. You know, I've, I've had like really, really like dark times over it as well because it got, it got to the point where when, when I was on the first show, I was literally offered couple of months later I was off like offered like the first spin-off show which I didn't even have to audition for because when you initially go on the show there's like a whole audition process and everything yeah. to like, yeah. pick everything. Because obviously it's it, it was promoting all C D but you know it's all like made for T V so you know it's like structured and um, scripted and mm-hmm. you know just turning tongue in, tongue in cheek and having a laugh, and I had an amazing experience with everyone involved. But it's designed to be entertaining as much as informative. Yeah, Yeah, completely. People watch it and they're like, oh, they'll pick out something I said, and then they'll bully me on it, saying that, you know, I shouldn't have said this and all that. But, you know, you're told what to say, basically, and it's like all just, like, basically fun. It was really funny. You know, it was a really funny show and everything. 
but they'll pick up pick stuff out and I got offered the spin-off show a couple of months after that and I wasn't even going to take it because of all of the like the hell that I had after I appeared on that show it didn't even start when I was on the show it started when I was on the trailer because the there was a clip of me in the trailer so it literally started a week before the show even come on because I was in the trailer then I did a BBC um, news interview about OCD you know the hate I got from that like people saying how dare I go on um you know TV and talk about OCD and Mm-hmm. You know, that I should be embarrassed and ashamed and stuff, you know, and they, they were making me feel like that I should have hid the fact that I had OCD and I shouldn't even dare speak about the fact. Mm. You know, I was treated worse than a criminal. I swear to God, I was treated really bad. I couldn't even walk to my local shop. It was like, you know, in the olden days when they would like um, burn the witches and stuff and there'd be a witch <laughs> going to like, they would come up with all the like the. Pitchforks and torches, they're all standing out there waiting. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't Game of Thrones. Shame. Shame. Oh, right, right. I kid you not, right? That's what it was like. And it was as if I'd committed the worst crime known to man. And all I'd basically done was follow my dreams and like spread an awareness for yeah. you know, and I, the the hate I got. It's absolutely ridiculous, and that I still get to this day from certain individuals. I'd see this with Adam. Who, I mean, oh, the mate. stuff that you go through. What I, I, I've got to say, I don't know how you, I, 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 I don't know how you handle it, there, Kelly. Adam handles it beautifully because he just makes them look like the idiots they are, with this kind of avant-garde plum that he just <laughs> he just absolutely um, tears them to pieces. Unless it's really, really serious. Jealousy makes people tell the worst lies on you, and mm. that's something that stuck with me because it's so true. Yeah. I've, I've had people make lies up about you, about me, and I'm like, they wanting people to, like, hate you as much as what they hate you for some reason. And yeah, yeah. Some of the lengths some people have gone to, I swear to God, there was this one time, right, I would get this hate of this one particular family. And so for my 30th birthday, I'm not 30 anymore, like, literally. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to no. say my age, right, because... Well, man, I, I'm 29. I have been for years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, 20, 20, 23. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and six foot six four. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a four in here. Um, they, they came down right in the for my thirtieth birthday. They must have found out off of the people that knew me because they didn't know how old I was. Because obviously, I look a lot younger than what I am because I'm a lot older than thirty now. But uh, <laughs> they come in, they, co- they covered my whole car in thirty happy birthday, thirty banners and balloons and everything. The whole shebang. Like who does that? I I'd have, I'd have done it. I've done I've done worse <laughs> for mates' birthdays. I've done some like proper messed up stuff for a friends of mine's birthdays. I think we filmed his entire we broke into his house while he was at work. <laughs> and if you're watching this Louis, hey, it was me. And <laughs> we filled every single drawer in his house with like to the brim with Skittles. Oh, that's, that's... <laughs> I'd be happy with that. The whole sk- you, I kill you actually because if my daughter got a hold of Skittles, we'd yeah, be yeah. in hell. Sugar and colours uh, are not good. But <laughs> uh, Duncan Cashman for years, man, has wondered what this two and a half grand in Skittles look like. <laughs> I now know. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter's heaven, my hell. That's yeah, exactly yeah. what that is. <laughs> well, Duncan, get ready for the best or worst <laughs> birthday ever. Come in a Devon, baby. Come in a Devon. Um, anyway, let's, Devin. <laughs> Kelly, let's, uh, let's, how dare you? Kelly, let's, let's backtrack a little bit. So while all this, this hate and this, and let's call it what it is, bullying is yeah. going on. Did you, because I used to work for the company who made OCD cleaners and country house cleaners. So I know a little bit about the, the process you'd had to go through and talking to um, Dr. H and, and stuff. What kind of support kind of psychological support did you receive from the the show and the company? Initially, like, before you go on the show, you get, like, a screen and with a psychologist and stuff. 
and then during during the whole show you get you get a you know every day on hand whenever you need it but after the show like you don't get well i didn't get much support the show like obviously still kept in touch and they would bring bring us like me and a friend down you know every now and again and stuff and you know they would keep in touch that way but mental health wise there, there really wasn't nothing after the, the shows had finished it was really hard because it, it, it was kind of like you were just stuck in the deep end because they do prepare you for, for what's to come because they do say you're going to get bad comments it's just you're going to get it I don't think you know how you're going to feel until that actually happens you know right um, so I think people take take in different ways and I mean, to be honest, now my skin is so much darker than what it was back then. I really couldn't care less now. Like people could say whatever they want about me. I've I've learned to do. You develop like, a callus, don't you? It's like any kind of you know. I'm a guitarist, and the, the more resistance you get, and the more pressure you get on your fingers, the more the calluses build up on the tips. You develop that, but you don't start with that. You've got to kind no. of go through that fire if you. And like, yeah. I'm a really sensitive person as well, so like. I'm the kind of person that watches Titanic for the millionth time and still cries. <laughs> so if, I, just, I just, sometimes it was really hard to deal with, you know, but then I look back and I think, why did you let it bother you so much? And I, I can't, I can't explain why I did, but I did. And I swear to God, it, it, it got me like on the edge. I mean, the, the dark, like thoughts did cross my mind, you know, at that time, I just felt like the whole world hated me. When you're in that situation and um, you're feeling like that, I think it's a really, really horrible place to be. And Do you think the bullies on the other end of the keyboard, if you like, because this is where it seems to take place now. It's internet-based because everyone's anonymous behind their keyboard and they can say whatever the hell they like. And do you think they just don't realise the impact it has or they don't care? Is it? Is it that they think this is just going to get me some likes and some notoriety, or is it that they that they generally don't care about the impact they have? Because it strikes me that there's always another real person at the end of that comment that's being affected. And for me, if I was in that position, if I realised just the impact I was having on someone's life, I would be mortified. Do you think it's that? Do you think it's the anonymity that's allowing this? Do you think people realise what they're saying? I think for some people it is because a lot of people use fake accounts to write like horrible things mm. but a lot of people use the real accounts and you'll go on to them and like they're like they're putting pictures on like saying be kind and they're they're promoting bullying themselves and mm. yes they're bullying as well and you know they'll have kids and I don't understand it because you know, I've had the worst bullying from, like, local people, so it's people who I actually know. Some of them, like, I've never spoke to in my life, but a lot of them I have. But either way, they all know me. So mm. it's like they're not kind of – they're not anonymous, you know, they're not hiding behind a computer. Fair enough, they haven't said it to me, like, face to face. But, you know, I've had where they'll get the kids to do it, so they'll, like, get um the teenagers or the younger kids to, like, um abuse me rather than them doing it. I don't understand people like that because obviously they, they know you're in there, and so I think yeah. it's hard when when it's pe when it's people you know. But I have no idea why they do it because they know that it upsets people. And fair enough, I mean, there's jokes, there's tongue tongue in cheek behaviour, and you know, there's like banter. But then there's just really damn right horrible and um, abusive comments. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. The, there's no excuse um, for it. So I don't understand what would make any person do anything like that because I wouldn't dream of saying some of the stuff that I've seen on social media said about people. And it's why Why are you saying it? Because the, the word banter is one that gets thrown around a lot. Yeah. Uh, and I think sometimes it's used as a, a get out of jail free card. To me, yeah. banter is uh, more relational than topical or situation. We have a lot of banter on this show, don't we? We oh, we we we, we, we go forth. for it, but we know each other. Like we, we know each other, we, and we know that beneath that, there's a deep love and respect yeah. for each other that comes out. Yeah, yeah, and, and we also we also earn the right, right? We we put up with Chris for two years, <laughs> right? <laughs>
If I want to call him gentle Ben, but a prick, I will call him gentle Ben. <laughs> but actual words I've said. If this is your first exposure to the show, actual words I've said. <laughs> Jeff, but also, put that clip in now. <laughs> uh, but also, I don't... This is going to sound bizarre, but try and stay with me. I don't mind the behaviour in and of itself. It's the lack of accountability mm -hmm. yeah. I'm bothered by. And if you're going to do it, own it. Yeah. If you're really, if your bollocks are really that big, stand there, plant your feet, and be like, yeah, I said it, and what? And that doesn't happen. Someone wants some, put on one of my videos, oh, imagine seeing him down a dark alley. And then I replied, well, then that's not a dark alley. That's a well-lit alley with a disabled guy in it. <laughs> like, try harder. And then, and then straight away, it's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. My cousin spelt wrong, had my phone spelt wrong. And, <laughs> and, and I'm like, dude, own, like, own, own your shit. Own it. You were going for Sonny. You came over 20. We've all done it. I've done it. I've said things about people online that I sincerely regret. Yeah, it, it's, it's a weird dichotomy. Yeah, definitely. Definitely own what you're saying. Because, obviously, if you've said it, then... I mean, there's a, there's no getting away from the fact that you've said it, whether you want to blame your dog, your cousin or whatever. You know, we all know what it was you. So just, yeah, definitely own it. I think that's the key, isn't it? I mean, I've said things I regret. I, I've yeah. spoken about before, actually, that I had friends in back in Australia who have an autistic son. And I used to think, geez, they go on about it, don't they? But yeah, the man upstairs obviously has a sense of humour. And now I have an autistic daughter. Yeah. <laughs> and an autistic wife and uh, i live in this world and it's you know it, it, it was a real lesson to me but I, I don't think i was never bullying about it but i think the problem is that the age of the people who are on the net bullying are so young and we don't i think genuinely there's there's an element of age understanding of what bullying does you can say something like you know in the schoolyard sort of situation people say things they don't realize the impact it's going to have i i spent a lot of my years being bullied at school and the funny thing is online i guess on through you know people i've reconnected with on facebook and stuff like that i've had people apologize to me for for saying yeah. things that they said but they've also you know I, i've come to see them as you know the human beings they are and the thoughts they have but you know, it, it's that understanding that I, I think at a certain age we don't understand bullying. And I mean, this this experience obviously directed you towards a real passion for standing up for bullying because you obviously you you're a, an ambassador for a Canadian charity. Is that right on anti bullying? What worth living is a Canadian charity so that 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 like deals with like mental health and stuff and like everything that comes with that like bullying um anything to do with mental health. I'm also like an ambassador for Bullies Out, which is like the UK bullying charity. Yeah, bullying is a, a topic really close to my heart because, you know, sadly, there is a lot of lives lost over bullying. And I do think that even now, even though like the world is more accepting, like in a way of a lot of things, and there's so much more awareness out there, there's so much like, still so much like work to do because there's so mm. much more bullying i think more now than what there ever was i think it's, it's got more insidious now yeah. mm. bullying 10 15 20 years ago it was in the schoolyard it was on your way home you got through your front doors and it was done that was what yeah. it was like for me you know i could shut the doors and <sighs> breathe really? and i'm home now you pick up your phone and it's on your phone. You pick, you know, you check your Facebook, it's on your Facebook, it's on your Instagram, it's on your Snapchat, it's on your whatever yeah. social media you're using. You're being compared to supermodels who filter their photos through every filter known to man before it ever gets presented as being, this is me. Yeah. And we've got this, this culture of, it's, it's like this bullying culture that goes beyond the four walls of your home, they invade your personal space and you get this. And I think that's why it's so much more prevalent now because they don't stop at the door. I used to get off the bus. I could walk home and decompress. Yeah. But now it's on your phone. It's the comments. It's the random things. It's what's being spread around. I, I had to have a talk to my daughter this week about, you know, I want her to be able to text a friend. I was trying to say, don't ever send anything dodgy. Yeah. Don't say anything that's going to expose yourself physically, yeah. mentally, whatever, because that can go around like wildfire. It's this 
culture we have now with social media that really encourages this insidious side of bullying it really does and you know i don't think to be fair i don't think it's ever going to stop i really don't because there's so many more procedures out there to help with bullying and awareness now than what there ever was and like all the be kind campaigns and all the work in schools and that but i just think it's something bullying is just in like people and i think kids are always going to bully like it's, it's so much gonna... easier to punch down than punch up oh yeah and i i do a lot of assemblies on um anti bullying i deliberately do it with older kids because you can just be a lot more direct yeah. with with the whole thing. And I'm like, yeah. what advice would you give to someone being bullied? I'm like, talk to someone, talk to anyone. Talk to your parents, talk to your counsellor, talk to your teachers. There's no shame in being a victim and in how you're feeling. If I'd have done it, I'd have gotten a lot more done at school than I did. And if you're someone here and you are being a bully, for the love of God, get your shit together. And grow up. Definitely. But then when but then when you say get your shit together, they go, <gasps> and like see, see, we're all more bothered at the fact that I swore. <laughs> you know, there are kids going home suicidal from school every day because yeah. they're being bullied. And then that really drives the point home. I really do the same school twice, Duncan, I'll be honest. <laughs> but it, it drives the point home. <laughs> Kelly, I wanna I wanna bring this back to so I mean, we, we've discussed the OCD. I, I also, I mean, you talked about the fact that you, you've got, or you're autistic and you are um, neurodivergent, I guess, and you're experiencing these things. You've gone through the bullying. You've gone through all these things. You've really made yourself a champion for, for these people and for yourself. I, I really like that you've got that pride in it. That's taken you on now to this uh, short film you've made. I believe you've directed, you're in all about OCD and what it's like living with it? Well, to be honest, it's like basically just the struggle of someone with OCD and the like ramifications, I guess, that it could have on somebody. And that it's kind of like a struggle that nobody knows. Like it's her, no. just her own struggle. And it's kind of like a da story, but I wanted it to be like, you know, Hard hitting, you know. I didn't yeah. want to like um, tiptoe around the subject. And You're not pulling listen. punches on this. This is honest, no, warts and all. I have people around me who, because like I live in a small village and stuff, and all my friends and family, nobody's like into TV stuff. Want to be on TV? Want to do anything like that? It's kind of shone upon. Oh, why do you want to like kind of air your dirty washing in public? Why do you want to do this? Why? Like, but for me, it's like a need. It's like a, a hunger that I've got to do to like kind of rest my mind, if you know what I mean. I've I think just, it's yeah. also that thing of it, there's this kind of thing of, I want to shine a light on these things because these are things that people live with every day. Definitely. And we have these things like ITV talking about Get Britain Talking and we've got all this sort of stuff about it. But yet when you actually open up and talk about it, people can be very standoffish. And I really respect that you've taken that and got, you know, you're not, Fuck yeah, I'm going to do this anyway. There's, there is so much stigma still, you yeah. know, especially for like mental health and, you know, any any kind of like disorders like that. And for some reason, I think it was glamorized a bit OCD because people would just think, oh, it, it's someone who likes to clean. When it's we become OCD's become something that's almost sort of it's it's a tagline now, isn't it? I'm a bit OCD about that. I'm a bit OCD about this and whatever. Oh, I hate but that. Actually, oh. that really diminishes what people who genuinely experience <laughs> OCD every day go through. To be fair, I, I don't. I don't even really like cleaning. It's I've got <laughs> to that. Like it's that need you, you've got to do it whether you like it or not because you you might yeah. want it if you don't. People don't understand who just think it's about cleaning, how debilitating it can be. Because, mm. I mean, it's like you're at a war with yourself constantly. Just you, basically, even just simple tasks like drinking out of a cup, you know, you know, when, when, when like the anxiety is so high and your rituals are playing off, you know, you'll have to drink it a certain way. If you don't do it right, you've got to do it again. And then, it goes on and on and on like that, and mm. it's just every aspect. The only thing I can actually 
like the example I can give you is like, you know, if you if you're superstitious and like you don't want to step under a ladder and stuff like that, it's like that constantly. You, you your mind won't let you do it for whatever kind of kind of reason. It it's like never ending. It's always there, but when when your anxiety is really high, you wish it would get really, really worse. But for mm. some reason, it seems to be easier somewhere new because then your rituals haven't already been made, so you, you've got a fresh start kind of thing. It's almost like a reset button. Yeah. Yeah, or like a break. Because I like junk and hate it when people use um, language like OCD um, in like a colloquial manner. I was playing Magic the Gathering on Friday, and yeah. one of the guys who's in our little group, I just I just overheard him say it, and he went, oh, we're all a little bit autistic. And I was like, can we go have a chat outside just right quick, in like yeah. in private? And then he's like, you know, whatever you can say, you can say it here. And I was like, I'm going to give you one last chance to come outside and me quietly and have this conversation. Yeah. And then one of the other guys who knows what, what I was going to say, I was just like, you should really go outside to have this, <laughs> have this conversation. <laughs> I'm going to get blown up in front of 21 grown men. I think we have this hum human thing that is to try and trivialise whatever is experiencing. In some ways, it's a positive thing. I mean, you, you look at the jokes that came out after COVID and the, or, or swine flu, you know, and all that kind of stuff, all these things that have come up. And there's something cathartic about humour that allows us to process and deal with things. But there's, there's a line where we cross from humour to offence. It's a very fine line sometimes. But it's so important to have that self-awareness that, and like you guys were saying before, being able to go, you know what, I went too far then, and I'm really sorry. So many people online, you know, you, celebrities who get caught up with things that they said years ago, if they just said, you know what, I really messed up. Not even yeah. trying to justify it. I said the wrong thing. It was nearer where you could say that maybe. But that doesn't mean it was right, and I, I, I'm mortified that I said it. You know what I mean? The way you you deal with it afterwards, it, it shows the genuine heart behind the person. I mean, nobody's perfect. Everybody at some point in their life has said something that they shouldn't have said, whether it's to a friend, a family member, something. You've said something that you thought, oh, I think I just went a bit too far there. Adam makes a thing of it on our show. He talks constantly about things he said and done that should never have been said and done. <laughs> and I turned out okay. <laughs> if, if I was going to get cancelled, Duncan, it would have happened years ago. <laughs> they tried, they failed, and ultimately, and I can't stress this enough, I'm disabled, I don't know any better. There's something else I wanted to talk to you about. It's something that's not spoken about a lot. And this is something that, I mean, one of the things I've really respected about, you know, looking into all the things that you do and the things that you've you've been about and the light you shine on things, something you told me that I didn't know, actually, it hasn't come up in any of the research, was that you have fibromyalgia. Yeah. My wife also has fibromyalgia. Funnily enough, I think it goes along with neurodivergence quite strongly. I, I, this is only my own musing, seeing a lot of the neurodivergent people I know often have things that accompany like fibromyalgia or ME and stuff like that. Uh, what's that like living with day to day? Because I, from seeing how it affects my wife, she can be the life of the party one day and then yeah. she'll spend a week in bed because yeah. she's just absolutely destroyed. What's it like for you living with, especially with your everything you're doing i mean i have a uh, like limited for like the stuff that i was doing to now because you know my, my symptoms have been getting a lot worse because literally i used to do so much stuff like especially with my community work and everything like literally i kind of like transformed my whole community and like nothing it was like you know bad antisocial behavior you know crime running down like I would literally single-handedly hold community meetings I would go out and you know cut grasses do up run down empty land law buildings you name it I did it donated um community flower tubs I'd be out getting my hands dirty all the time constantly that had a, an, an awful toll on things because with fibromyalgia like if you if you do like say you go out and you mourn the lawn that could send you in bed for two days, you know, for you to recover from that. Mm. And 
that's what it does with me like any kind of strenuous work like that or even just a day shopping I, I could be out in bed for a couple of days you know riddled in pains and I also have like I have severe disc degeneration in like two of my cervical spines so literally the the discs in between mine are like non-existent so like my bones are like just rubbing on each other and I get a lot of nerve pain and that from that. My um, wife has the hip dysplasia and it's interesting that they combine quite. Yeah, I think they all hand in hand, you know, hypermobility as well. Like I, I have that as well. So it's like, it, I think it all plays a part in it. So yeah, it can be, like you say, it could be the life of the party going out you know because if people like look at some of my pictures on social media they'll be like oh there's nothing wrong with her she's having the time of her life but that'll be like maybe one day out of like four weeks where I'm I'm like having the time of my life yeah. and then other weeks I'll be in bed like you know not even being able to go to the toilet you know what I mean just well, I think taking it back to what we talked about right at the beginning I think an element of masking takes place it's almost like I'm going to suppress this. You know, like I, my wife loves a strong men competition. We've just been watching it before I came down to this, the whole British, British strongest man. Mm. And you see them trying to suppress that pain yeah. and hold it in. You know, the lactic acid's flowing. They're in agony, but they're holding these cars up. Not not like Simon held a mini up, just to be clear. <laughs> Proper actually holding a car up. Yeah. And, yeah, it's it's all that pain. And they're, 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 they're suppressing it. They're pushing it down. They're not letting it get to them. And it's like... And it's like that for these things. You can be experiencing pain and it's like, I'm going to ride this until I can get home and then it crashes. Like, I'm a totally different person Like when I'm at home and that because obviously I won't, like, there's some things that you just don't let the, the world see unless, like, obviously you'll see it in my documentary and stuff. But, you know, day to day, it's like people don't see that other side yet. Sometimes, like, you feel guilty as well for being in bed. Like, I'll be in bed and I'll be like, you know, feeling so much guilt that I'm in bed because obviously my boyfriend's um paralyzed and stuff so I'll have a lot of like guilt because you know you know because he's so upbeat he's he's just amazing you wouldn't believe how amazing he is and how like optimistic he is about everything like all the approach and yeah everything he has to go through on a day-to-day -day basis when I get all my symptoms and stuff because like I am in chronic pain every day I like hide it from him sometimes as well because I feel guilty for like it's kind of like I'm burdening him with, with like my stuff that seems so much more minor compared, compared to, to his. You know what I mean? That's the way I feel, and so I, I kind of like some sometimes deal with it on, on my own. You know, but it, there is a lot of guilt about um not being able to get out of bed and being in like so much pain and that. Last night was a really bad night for me as well because I was in agony. Literally, I, I was just basically crying. For like half the night, I didn't get. We didn't get to sleep till half five because of my symptoms last night. I mean, that's how bad it can be sometimes. Some people don't understand unless it's like happening to them because, especially mm -hmm. with invisible diseases, pe people are like just they, they they can't get their head around the fact how you can be so ill but look so so like not ill. And believe me, I still try to get my head around it as well. And you know, I I, I still have to with that guilt and everything and your wife will understand what i'm saying because it, it affects you so much it does and it's it, it one informs the my experience is that one informs the other yeah my wife will mm -hmm. feel crap need to take that time and i'll get a slurry of messages saying i'm really sorry i feel so crap i'm sorry i'm so crap i'm sorry this i'm sorry that i'm sorry the guilt is overriding and that almost feeds back into the mental anguish which then yeah. informs the physical anguish <clears throat> and creates this vicious cycle yeah. the guilt i think the biggest the biggest part for me because you always think to yourself oh well you know it could be worse you know what i mean there's people out there that's got a lot of worse happening but then you, you need to take a second to think well you know i have been through a lot myself as well and what i'm going through is you know it is bad and but it's just getting your head around that guilt. It's just hard to do. And then obviously with my physical symptoms and everything that's going on, it makes my OCD so much worse. That the OCD part of it is just, just a nightmare because it's just you, your mind never switches off. It's constant, constant. Every single thing, like going to the car, the, the way like 
the way you sit and the way you lie in bed. They need to know that the struggle. And I think this is why I've been so open about it. And, you know, I'm not afraid to, for what and all, you know, I, I said how it is now, because when I was a kid, I hid the fact with my OCD. I didn't know it was OCD because I didn't know what OCD was then. Yeah. But I knew that it wasn't normal it, per se, you know what I mean? It was like, I knew that other people weren't having it. And I, I felt that it was that bad that I had to hide it from everyone. When I found out what OCD was, then I was kind of relieved because I was like, oh, well, that, that's what it is. But I still didn't yeah. dare talk to family about it and say, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm having this. I kind of made the leap from me having it and co- co- coming out and being aware of it myself and, like, accepting it myself and then going straight into that TV show and then, or like, just being public about it, like, I did, there was no in between where I went to other people and spoke about it. I think there's a great deal to be said for um taking ownership of one's um medical yeah. conditions and learning about them, so you then can talk about them. Because yeah. the worst thing I could certainly do would be go on TV and sort of have a little bit of a guess yeah. about the whole thing. So much like you, I, I like to know that when I'm when when the cameras are rolling and when the, when the spotlight's on, I know what I'm doing, and I I know what I'm saying. Like the amount of research we would do for the the podcast when we aren't really dealing in in medicine or disability a lot of the time, we're just talking like just poor lads having having a chin wag. That doesn't mean you can sort of like take your foot off the gas, yeah, and and let it slide. And when when the world's watching, that's when you need to be be on it and be that sort of either person that reframes the disability conversation for someone less enlightened, or, and I'm sure you, you get this a lot, the person that's been looking for a role model for so long hasn't found one, and then they see you and hear about you and just go, yes, sister, that's my girl. I mean, I imagine you get a lot of really nice messages off the back of your your work okay. Among, amongst all the, the haters and yeah. and the bullshit like let the haters hate sister you're way too late um what like i, I imagine there's a lot more good than bad there, there really is there really is and you know that's what brought me through my darkest times you know it, it doesn't take that much effort to go out and like spread hate and write a nasty comment about someone but i think it takes a, a lot more effort if it's somebody that's been through something you're you're going through or someone who feels inspired by you and they write a nice message and then they're talking about their lives and stuff like that that just touches you and i i, I never i never get like sick of seeing or hearing people's stories who message me mm-hmm. and you know I've i've had loads of collaborations from the back of it I would never have done as much stuff as what I've done now if like I hadn't have come out and you know initially took took them shows on and did what I did because it, it's just brought like loads of opportunities that would never have come my way otherwise and I've met so many really nice amazing inspirational people themselves really have yeah, it's like a whole new world isn't it Exactly. The more we talk about it, the more we open up, the more we express ourselves and share who we are, the more we open that world up for other people who really need to find it. This is the way I see it now. If there's just one person out there that you can help, like somebody who's like on on the brink themselves and just needs somebody, you know, to talk to or aspire to or, you know, just to believe in. If you can just help that one person, then everything is all worth it because there's always somebody out there who who actually need your help and you might not see it like right now but they do because you know that that's how I felt I wish I had somebody when I when I was younger that had OCD and you know was going through what I did because I had no idea what was going on you know sometimes I would think I was crazy you, you've got no one to talk to about and you then go to anybody and talk to them in case they think you're crazy and it was that kind of stigma. If you dare talk about anything to do with mental health, you always have this fear, oh, they're going to lock me up. And It's like a label that's just stamped on your forehead suddenly, isn't it? That you, you are this, that's who you are. And you okay. forget about the rest of who you are. That's. Just, I like that now where I think we're moving into a society slowly, not nearly fast enough, but my daughter's autistic, but that's not, that's who she is and that's who she identifies as being. But her personality goes so far beyond that. Definitely. It's not just that one label. She is 
this amazing person. You know, you can see that through your life. I think the way you share your life is amazing because people see beyond the label that's there to the person behind it. Well, to be fair, when I was first diagnosed with being autistic, you know, it took me a while to wrap my head around it because it's just that word. I felt like there was loads of stigma to that word and people just automatically assume that, yeah, you were like... um, You're Rain Man. That's all they think. For years, it was, oh, so you you crack the cards, yeah? You can count. Yeah, definitely. Those people... People, that's what they do, and I know that it's changing so much now. And like you know, I hope that I'm helping to change that as well. But it took me a little while to wrap my 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 head around it as well. There's always that like fear, isn't it? And I think that's what stops people from doing a lot of things. It's just the fear. And when you learn to overcome that fear, I just think it's like you're unstoppable. Basically, it's just your own mind that is stopping you from doing anything. You know, because I've done like a lot of charity stuff, like. I have teamed up with a lot of charities. Like I've done a lot of ambassador work and celeb football matches and loads of stuff like that. But I like to do my own stuff, you know, just from out my own back without even asking anyone to do it with me. I'll just, I'll be in the supermarket one day and I'll be like, oh, I'm just going to buy like a trolley, a trolley full of food and I'm just going to give it to somebody who passes, right? That That's the kind of person I am. I'm really spontaneous. That's awesome. Those yeah. random acts of kindness. I love that stuff. I think and then I'll go around and see where all the homeless people are because they'll always be, like, in the same regular spot. This is what I do, like, twice a year. I always do it at Christmas, and then sometimes I do in the year. I'll make, like, hampers, so I'll do, like, clothes, food. There's a couple that, like, always has a dog and, like, one that has two, so I'll do, like, a dog hamper as well. And I'll just go out and give them, and I love doing stuff like that. I do my own Christmas appeal with, like, toys as well and presents for women you know for the women and children and um, charities I, I always do like collaborations and I've raised a lot of money and stuff but I like to be hands-on and go and meet these people myself and give give the donations that I that I have myself to these people and I really like to do that what goes into a doggy hamper like I, I know that's a ridiculous question <laughs> but I'm just so so cute and also I've never had a cat hamper because I think cats are ungrateful by nature <laughs> like doggy hampers <laughs> Cats are born smokers, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> if if a cat was, they would all be smokers because they'd all be like, yeah, <laughs> blow it in your face. It, I, yeah, cats are just. Yeah. Well, there's so many stuff you can get for dogs. I mean, there's like blankets, toys, treats, food, so many things. Like I'm the kind of person. I'm a typical woman. I know, stereotypical, but I love shopping. You know, the toy aisle, the Christmas aisle, the, the pet aisle, just any kind of aisle I love. <laughs> and and, and that, that time of year is coming up now. I, I have this hard and fast rule. The first shop I'm in that plays All I Want for Christmas is You by Myra Carey, I smash it up. <laughs> and I'll leave. I'm like, oh, fucking God. November. <laughs> <laughs> you would hate Australia. Mm-hmm. In Australia, they don't do Halloween in a big way. Oh, and there's no fireworks night. Christmas starts mid September, and you've got oh. three months of excruciating. Ah, oh, every no, ah, uh, no wonder we own you. Hell. Jesus <laughs> I love everything like that. I just get you're you know, a big Christmas like... person, aren't you? I can tell you're the person who you hear the oh. songs and you wait you know, for the Coca Cola ad, don't you? I know this. <laughs> I've already been watching Christmas movie and having the. Like, Oh, what, right? Ha- hang on one sec. One sec. Oh, is, is he going to make me angry? Isn't it, Duncan? Is he going to really annoy <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's going to wind me up. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I started in the summer holidays, right? I've, I've like, literally wrapped loads of presents up with the Christmas music on. <laughs> I, I admire that forward planning. Oh, I need to get on it. I need to get... I've only got one thing. I, I, I went to an award ceremony last week called the Make a Different Awards. Yeah, I've seen and, that. And, and, and how's that go, Duncan Casburn? Surprisingly well. Thank you, Adam. Surprisingly well. I still think, that, I still think the other contestants... Yeah should have demanded a recount because I'm quite certain I shouldn't have been I shouldn't have been the winner. But oh, basically people that were there. But that's the thing. This community oh thank you. <laughs> this community though, I think when you you the disabled community, the Sen community, the you know, anybody who's minorities almost or people who have to 
struggle in life beyond what the average everyday person has to. They become amazingly giving people. Something happens. You think they become far more selfish, <clears throat> but almost <throat> without exception, people become far more giving and looking for ways that they can contribute. And I think that's a perfect example of it. Kelly, I can't thank you enough for joining us. If people want to reach out to you, see your documentary, see your film that you've made, where can they do this? Yeah, well, um, they can go on my Facebook at Kelly Waite BCA or Twitter at Miss Kelly Waite or they can see my movie on Samsung TV, um, Amazon Fire Stick, Roku. Mm. I can't think of any more off the top of my head. But what we'll do is we'll put all these links in the description. So you you can uh, who are watching, you can hop over, click straight on the um, links, and you'll get straight to all the bits and pieces that Kelly's doing because get out there and support. And one more thing I want to ask is that I, I want to go back to the bullying thing because it's really something that I think is so important. If you're experiencing bullying, where would you recommend people can go to get support for them? They can come straight to my inbox. I mean, I'm there 24-7, you know, you can come and talk to me any time of the day. I would also say just go to anybody, anybody you trust, whether it's your best friend. I know it's hard, especially for the younger generation, to go to your parents. I know that's really hard. But go to your friend, go to a school counsellor. I know in in my personal experience, it's easier to speak to people that you don't know, like over the phone, like a counsellor. Just please speak to somebody, really. And there are anti-bullying charities out there that will pick up the phone and listen bullying, to you. The Samaritans, there's so many people out there who are 24-hour support. And like I said, my inbox is always there if you ever need to talk to somebody. And, you have and I want to take it a step further. If you think you're bullying someone and you haven't realised until now just the damage that you could be doing, what do you think someone should do in that situation? Where could they go to get support and help for where they're at? Like I said, my inbox is always open. You can go to anyone, speak to anyone. If you genuinely, if you if you are really sorry about, you know, something that you've said or anything, you could always, the best thing, I think, is for you to go to that person and just apologise. It would mean so much to that person to hear that apology from you. Yeah. But I think that could really, really help both of you if you, if you really want to do that, definitely. Some some people could take one one bad comment and it could just be like you know what Rocket Duck's back but other people that could be like the end of you know the straw that broke the camel's back you know yeah. so if you ever want to apologize it's never too late for someone to hear that amen kelly i can't thank you enough for joining us this has been fascinating and enlightening in so many ways i really thank you so much thank you so much both of you for having me i've loved it fantastic Thanks, yeah. So there it is. That was Kelly. And isn't she amazing? What a fantastic interview and just an amazing human being, in my opinion. Please do go hit like, hit subscribe, ring the bell. You'll always know when I've got new content coming up. You'll also be helping me hit that 10K mark. Please go do it. It'll be amazing. I'll put all of Kelly's links in the description as well, so you can go follow her and do what you need to do there. I will see you again on the next episode. But in the meantime, please do stay safe.